Good morning, church family. Again, I'll try it one more time. I know we're smaller today, but we can do this. So let's try it one more time. Good morning, church family. Yes, all right. It's a great morning. I hope you're all excited to be here. Uh, have one quick announcement. Uh, this week we are doing the second half of VBS uh, for the older kids, so second grade through fifth grade. And so if you are interested in that, please make sure you get registered. We're doing it on the 21st and 22nd. So that's a Friday and Saturday. Again, because school started, we didn't want to do two school nights, Thursday night, Friday night. So we're doing it Friday night and Saturday night from 6 to 7.30 right here in the church parking lot. So we'd love to have you uh, be a part of that. Uh, with that being said, again, I just want to greet you, welcome you here this morning. Uh, it's good to see you all. I also want to mention uh, school is starting or has started for many this week. So we had a lot of high schools and middle schoolers and elementary start this past week. We have some starting this week. I know a lot of college students are starting this week. Uh, I start my master's program back up this week. So if you could just be praying for all our students and all our teachers as they're navigating this crazy time, I appreciate that and uh, look forward to, this, uh, to what God has for us in this school year. With that being said, I'm going to pray for us and open the service in prayer, but I'm also going to lift up our students and teachers uh, specifically this morning. So let's pray. Dear Father, thank you again for another morning that you've given to us, Lord. Uh, we just praise you again for the opportunity we have to come and sing praises to your name and glorify you, Lord. Just thank you again that you desire to have a relationship with us and that you've provided a way for us to do that. I just want to lift up the school year as uh, some have already started and some are starting this week. I just pray again that we would have an awesome school year, even though it may be different this year. I just pray again that it would be an opportunity to point people towards you and that we would grow in, in knowledge and wisdom this year. Give us a great, great uh, year and a great service now as we sing praises to your name. I pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Please stand with us as we go to the Lord in worship. Isaiah 45, 5 through 6. I am the Lord, and there is no other apart from me. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other.
Amen. You may be seated for just a minute. Psalm 119. You are righteous, Lord, and your laws are right. The statutes you have laid down are righteous. They are fully trustworthy. My zeal wears me out, for my enemies ignore your words. Your promises have been thoroughly tested, and your servant loves them. Though I am lowly and despised, I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is everlasting, and your law is true. Trouble and distress have come upon me, but your commands give me delight. Your statutes are always righteous. Give me understanding that I may live. Please stand with us.
great and mighty you are, our Lord. We, we praise you this morning. We give you all the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. John 1, 21 to 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started from the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels, white, two, uh, sorry, two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is, it that you, who is it that you were looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rebani, which means teacher. Jesus said, to her, Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them th that he had said these things to her. Now it's my turn. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. How are we doing this morning? Oh. That's it? That's all I got? I need a little bit of energy, a little bit of excitement, so let's try it again. How are we doing this morning? Are we happy to be here? Are you happy to be with us on the live stream? Can you cheer loud enough that I can hear you from here? No, it's not working. <laughs> well, last week we went through a passage of Scripture that uh, was really, really uh, difficult for me to personally um, study through and teach through, and we talked about that last time because it described... It describes the crucifixion and the death and the burial of Jesus. And um, I can't help but feel sadness and even shame uh, when I study and th pre preach through that text because I'm reminded of my own complicity in making uh, the crucifixion necessary. I, I remember um, it's always at the forefront of my mind that he's there because of my sin. And it's really difficult for me to to picture and to imagine and to remember that the king of the world, the, the, the son of God, the Messiah, that he had to die for my sins. And when I think about it again, um, it gets difficult for me and I get um, emotional, but not as emotional as I do when we continue the story. Because thankfully, as we're going to begin Looking at this morning, the crucifixion, it's not the end of the story. Because if all we could say about Jesus is that he died, then as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, our, our faith would be worthless and we would be worthy of nothing but pity. Because it would mean that the, the resurrection didn't happen. That resurrection is not possible. That Jesus had no power over sin and death. 
And that would mean that we are all condemned to death ourselves because Jesus wouldn't have the power to provide the life that he promises us. So when I look through this passage that we just read this morning, that we're going to be studying through this morning, I get excited and I praise God that it's not the case that Jesus is still in that tomb. In our passage this morning, we get to begin to see the worth of our faith in Christ because this morning we look at the resurrection. In our passage today, we see, we will see that the borrowed tomb in which Jesus' body was placed, it didn't stay occupied for long, no. So we get, get to begin to see today Jesus is alive. He's not dead. And because of his resurrection, that provides us with all the assurance that we need of our own faith in him. In the resurrection, the hope of salvation is realized. And as we are going to notice over these last few weeks in this gospel, because we are at the end here, What we're going to notice is that in John's gospel, he spends a lot more time talking about the resurrection than he did about the crucifixion. Jesus' death, while important, it only needed a few words, but his resurrection, what it accomplished, and how it changed the entire course of human history. John has a lot to say about this. And not even just in these last two chapters of his gospel, but also in his three letters and also in the book of Revelation. Because again, Jesus' death would be meaningless without his resurrection. And so this morning, let's begin by reading about the fact that Jesus did indeed rise from the dead. And look at how, again, his followers, his disciples, his closest friends, how they responded when they learn the truth of the empty tomb. Again, in verses 1 through 10 of John chapter 20, we read this. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb, both running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. So remember, where we're at in this narrative, Jesus, a few days earlier, had died. He had been crucified on a Roman cross. His body had been beaten. He shed blood. He was pierced. And then he died. He was placed into a borrowed tomb. Now we fast forward. It's a, it's a few days later. It's, it's early Sunday morning. And we see Mary Magdalene. And Mary Magdalene was the first person to see the empty tomb. She went to the tomb here on the first day of the week, Sunday, and she discovered when she got there that the stone that had been covering the tomb had been rolled away. So the question, who is this Mary? Well, we don't know much about her, but she is mentioned in all four Gospels. And from what we can see about her in Scripture, we can make some reasonable conclusions. First of all, apparently, Mary was rather financially well off. And she was able to contribute to supporting Jesus during his ministry after 
having been healed by Jesus himself. In Luke 8, 1 through 3, it says this, After this, Jesus traveled around from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. And so, even in this description, we see that she was a committed follower of Jesus, which would make sense if you'd just been delivered from demon possession. And though she isn't one of the twelve, we saw in our passage last week that she was one of the very few of his followers who were there with him until the end, who saw and witnessed the crucifixion as well. And she, so, she saw and witnessed all of this. She saw her rabbi, who she had followed for several years, who she helped to support financially. She saw him die and be carried away and placed in a tomb. And so she comes to this tomb early Sunday morning when it's still dark. And the reason why she comes to the tomb was in order to prepare his body for burial. Most likely because she didn't know that Joseph and Nicodemus had already taken care of this. In Mark 16.1 it says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might anoint Jesus' body. And so this is a scene that we come upon. Mary, mourning, grieving over the fact that Jesus had died. And she waits until the Passover is over early Sunday morning to go to the tomb in order to prepare his body for his burial. Something that would, it would have been extremely important to her because it was extremely important in their culture. More than likely, the fact that in their minds, that Jesus had been in the tomb since Friday and he hadn't been prepared for burial would have weighed heavily on them throughout this weekend. So it's basically as soon as they can, Mary and a few other women, they travel to Jesus' tomb in order to honor him in the only way they knew how. Or they find again when they arrive the stone had been removed from the entrance. And presumably, they look inside as well and see that the tomb is empty. And so probably in a panic, Mary runs back, rushes back to the disciples, specifically to Peter and to John, to tell them what had happened, what she had discovered. But because of her understanding at this point, because of where she was at, because she had no expectation of Jesus' resurrection, she incorrectly assumes and reports that Jesus' body has been stolen. So obviously this would have been very distressing news. Questions going through their mind. Who had taken the body of their beloved rabbi? Was it the evil Romans? Were they now even desecrating his body with their filthy pagan rituals? Was it the Sanhedrin? Had they stolen their body because they wanted to make sure that nobody could claim that he came back from the dead? In their minds, this was horrible news. And so Peter and John needed to go and see for themselves what had happened. Perhaps they thought that they could find some clues, that they could follow the clues and find Jesus' body. Or maybe they thought that perhaps Mary in her mourning and her grief and the fact that she was crying and it was dark outside and it was early morning, maybe she just missed the body and it actually was there. In any event, whatever they were thinking about, John tells us here that they ran towards the tomb. And John says that he got there first. Now, there's no real theological significance as to who got there first, no matter what you uh, may have seen. The most likely reason that John got there first is that because he was probably the y younger than Peter. He's thought to be the youngest of the disciples, maybe even only around 18 at this time. And Peter is thought to have been the oldest of Jesus' followers and could have been in his 
early 30s at this point. And so the 18-year-old outran the old man. It's not really significant who got there first. What's significant is the fact that they ran. This is a huge deal. See, in in first century Jewish culture, as it's still the case in many um, honor-shame cultures today, adult men don't run. They don't run anywhere. It's seen and believed to be childish. It's something that children do. And to be seen running as an adult man would have dishonored you in the eyes of the community. So the fact that Peter and John ran, this tells us what they thought about Jesus. It tells them their concern. It tells them the esteem in which they held Jesus, the fact that they were willing to dishonor themselves in order to protect the honor of their rabbi. So, they had hoped to protect his body from being desecrated and dishonored by whoever stole it. And when they got there, their worst fears were realized. They couldn't protect his body from desecration because, as they saw when they arrived, the tomb was indeed empty. Jesus' body wasn't there where it had been placed late Friday afternoon. But what was strange, as we see in John's description here, is the fact that only Jesus' body was missing. He goes out of his way to tell us that the linen burial cloths, even the face cloth, they were all still there. This would have been very troubling and really confusing to Peter and John. It, It makes no sense that someone would go to the trouble of stealing a body, but making sure to unwrap all of these linen cloths first and leaving them neatly piled on the burial slab. See, at this point, the idea, again, of of a resurrection, it still hadn't entered into their minds. And so they're confused by what they're seeing and they're understanding none of this makes sense. Which is why when Peter gets there and he sees, he goes directly into the tomb to get a closer look. And then John, right behind him, goes in as well. I want to figure out what's going on here. And it's when John enters into the tomb and he he gets the whole picture. He sees the burial cloths. He sees the face cloth lying on that empty slab. He finally starts to put the pieces together. This wasn't a grave robbing. Jesus' body hadn't been stolen. Now we see the light bulb beginning to flicker a little bit. John's beginning to remember. He's beginning to put all the pieces together. He remembers that he had been taught about this, that Jesus had said that he needed to die, that he must die and then be raised from the dead on the third day. Matthew 16, 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. So these statements like this, or Jesus' statement about the temple being torn down and he would rebuild it in three days, these are beginning to be understood in a whole new light. Jesus hadn't been talking about the temple. He was talking about himself. So at this time, hope begins to flood into John's heart. He saw and he believed that Jesus had indeed been raised from the dead, just as he said he would. Though he didn't understand that this too was part of Scripture's teaching that the Messiah's resurrection was almost also promised and predicted by God. Like in Psalm 16.10, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. And so with Peter and John here in this tomb, 
though he hadn't seen Jesus in the flesh, though he didn't understand everything that Scripture taught about the resurrection, John begins to believe. I think that's in this, in how Peter and John responded to all of this. I, see, I think we see an example for us to follow as well here today in two different ways. First, from their example, from their response to when Mary delivers this news, we see that it's okay. It's even a good thing to examine things, to research. We don't necessarily have to accept everything that people may claim especially about God and matters of faith on face value, especially when things seem to be out of the ordinary or unexpected. Peter and John respond to this extraordinary claim by going and examining the evidence for themselves. And for us too, we too, we need to respond to people's claims about God people's claims about matters of faith and Christian living. We need to respond by going and examining the evidence in light of all that we know about God, all that we know about His Word. We're not required to just accept things at face value because that isn't faith. Faith is reasoned belief. It's based on evidence. It's based on experience and strong faith requires examining the evidence. For example, look at how the Bereans responded to Paul's teaching that Jesus was the Messiah in Acts 17.11. Now, the Berean Jews were more noble of character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. We need to examine. We need to compare what people say, what they claim, what they teach to the truth that we have revealed in Scripture. Because the Scripture tells us and warns us that there are going to be people in this world. There are going to be even people in the church who seek to lie and lead us astray for their own benefit. Paul warns about this in Romans 16, 17, and 18, where he says this, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. So it's a good thing to examine, to research, to look at claims based on the truth that we know of God and His Word. Second example we see in John especially is how to respond then when we see and we experience the working of God in our lives. To respond with faith, with belief. Even and especially when we may not understand everything that's going on. John, at this point, he didn't understand all that Scripture had revealed and taught about Jesus and the resurrection. But he still believed what Jesus had taught him. And in our lives, we too, we often, we're not going to ever or understand everything that's going on. We're not going to understand everything about how God is working in our lives and working in the circumstances of our lives. And when we're faced with a lack of comprehension, of understanding, how are we to respond? We respond in faith. Even as we continue to examine and to seek wisdom and guidance and insight. But we also have to understand that God doesn't promise us complete clarity, absolute understanding of His will in all circumstances and all of His purposes. And when we don't understand everything that we think that we need to know, when something is going on that we just can't figure out what's happening in the moment, then we need to be like John here and believe and trust in the God that we do know. 
and His revealed intentions, even as we struggle with understanding what's going on in the moment. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him and He will make your paths straight. I wonder, I like to think that maybe it was actually this proverb that was going through John's mind as he and Peter were taking this all in. Though he didn't fully understand, he was at that point able to trust in his Lord and how he was working in the situation. And he was able to follow that straight and narrow path because even though he didn't understand it all, he knew that his Lord had raised from the dead. For John, it was enough to see the empty tomb. But as we go on in his gospel here, for the rest of the disciples, for his friends and followers, they would need to see and to hear from their risen Lord for themselves, for their faith. And so beginning in verse 11, and really throughout then the rest of the gospel that we have here, we see Jesus appearing to his followers in order to reassure them that his resurrection had taken place, that the hope that they had in him was not in vain, that he was who he claimed to be, that he had the power to make good on the promise of life that he had given to all who believe and follow him. In verses 11 through 18, we see the first of these appearances again to Mary Magdalene. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbioni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. And so after John and Peter leave the tomb, we can see that Mary here was not comforted by the empty tomb in the same way John was. In her grief, she just couldn't understand what had happened. And instead, so we see her standing out that side of the tomb weeping. Weeping as we saw Mary and Martha weeping at the death of their brother Lazarus. This was the weeping and wailing, the mourning of someone who has no hope. She had lost her Lord, the rabbi she had followed and learned from for all of these years, the only one who had been able to deliver her from the affliction of those demons. And now she's at the point where she can't even honor him by preparing his body for the grave. She's weeping, she's wailing, she's mourning over her loss and the pain that this loss had brought into her life. And in this grief, we see God coming to her. God giving her the comfort he promises to those who are his, who mourn. First, in verse 12, by sending 
two angels to this tomb. As Mary looks into the tomb, she sees two angels dressed in white sitting at the head and the foot of that burial slab. And in Luke's account, they were they're dressed in clothes that gleamed white like lightning, all pointing to the fact that they were from God. But at this point, Mary doesn't recognize them as angels. Maybe she couldn't see clearly through her tears. We don't know why, but we know that she doesn't recognize them. But even though she doesn't recognize them, they stop to ask her why she's weeping. Their question gets to the heart of the matter. They want Mary to stop and think about her mourning at the empty grave because the empty tomb should have been a source of joy not sorrow. Like John, it should have told her that Jesus had conquered death and that he had risen to life just as he had taught would happen and just as he had shown was possible through raising Lazarus to life just a few short days before all of this. But at this point, Mary didn't make that connection. Like we so often do ourselves, she's focused on herself, on her grief, on her fears. She thought Jesus was dead, and therefore her assumption was that somebody had taken his body and hidden it. She's so wrapped up in her grief that she doesn't recognize the messengers for who they were. Angels. In fact, she's so focused on her grief and the fear that brought with it that she doesn't even recognize Jesus himself when he stands before her. See, Jesus chose his first post-resurrection appearance to be with Mary Magdalene, a woman which was, again, as we've come to understand throughout this gospel, would have been extremely significant in this society. He chose to appear to Mary because this was what Mary needed. In her grief, she needed to be comforted. She needed to have her questions answered. And her grief turned to joy. And so he appears just as Mary turns around. And she sees him and she doesn't recognize him. Now, has something like this ever happened to you? Have you ever um, run into someone or see someone out of the blue and you just don't recognize them? Maybe um, if you think that they're somewhere else, that they're, never, that they're not anywhere near you. I know that um, I've seen a lot of videos of soldiers coming home to surprise their loved ones, their families, their kids, things like that. And almost inevitably, invariably, there's a point where, you know, the soldier walks up and is standing behind his son or sits down at the table next to his daughter and they turn and look. And almost always, there's this blank look on their face, right? It's like their brain just can't process what their eyes are seeing. It takes a moment or two, even if this person talks to the other person before recognition sets in and their brain processes what's happening and so they have this look of blankness for a couple seconds and then you just see their faces light up and joy come into their eyes and I think that that something like this is happening here. Jesus standing in front of Mary is just something that her brain can't process right now. Because in her mind, it's impossible. That's the last thing that she would have expected to see is Jesus standing behind her. And even after he speaks to her, she still doesn't put it all together because her mind isn't processing it. And so she retreats to the familiar and she assumes that the man standing before her is the caretaker of the garden. So he's standing there and 
Jesus asks her two questions, mirroring the angel's questions. Why are you weeping? And who are you seeking? Again, like the angels, he's trying to get her to stop and dig deeper into what's going on, dig into her grief, her response to the empty tomb. Her grief is about the empty spot in her life. She's mourning because of Jesus' absence. She's still seeking him, though she thinks she can no longer follow him. And the thing she thought she wanted to be able to honor him by providing the oils and and the herbs and spices needed for a proper burial, that last thing had been denied to her. And so when Jesus asked her these questions, thinking that he's the gardener, she gets to the heart of her own grief. She just wants to know where his body is. She's focused on the physical, on the one thing left for her to do. She doesn't recognize Jesus. She can't recognize him because in her mind she's, he's dead. Along with all of her hopes. Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him. I'll get him. And in this grief, in this mourning, this hopelessness even. Jesus says one word. Mary. Just her name. But that one word is enough to break through her grief, through her mourning, even through her fears, at the sound of her name coming from her Lord. Mary's grief is turned to joy. Imagine the love, the care, the tender compassion in the voice of Jesus as he speaks her name. Imagine the joy, the ecstasy of seeing your grief fleeing and hope returning. My beloved teacher, Jesus isn't dead. His body hasn't been stolen. No, the tomb is empty because Jesus is alive and standing in front of her right now. At this point, it's possible, it's probably very likely that that Mary depending on how far away they were, walked or ran towards him, maybe even embraced him, weeping still but now with tears of joy instead of grief. Whether or not that actually happened, her response to Jesus standing before her causes Jesus to warn her not to cling to him. Why would Jesus feel like it was necessary to tell Mary not to hug him? Well, I don't think this is just about a hug. Instead, this has to do with everything around his presence and her response. Mary is joyous, overjoyed, yes, but her joy is probably focused on the wrong thing. Because she now has Jesus physically present in her life once again. For Mary, it's probably less about the resurrection and everything that that it teaches. It's more about Jesus being back in her life again. She's filled with joy because Jesus is back. Life can go back to the way it was before. She can continue to follow Jesus and to minister to him as he ministers to Israel. And so Jesus telling her not to cling to him is his way of telling her that this is not the way it's going to be. Because though he had not yet ascended to the Father, he's going too soon. Which means that his physical presence being a part of her life, teaching her directly, face to face, 
this wasn't going to be the way it was going forward. Her hope, her joy, her faith, it couldn't be based on clinging to Jesus in the flesh before her because soon he wouldn't be in the flesh here in the world. Now, as he goes on to point to her, her joy needed to have an entirely different context, entirely different focus. Her faith needed to be based not on Jesus with her in the flesh, but Jesus with the Father in heaven. Because he was returning to the Father. And she and the other disciples, they needed to know that their relationship with him had changed. Because like everyone else who has come to know and to trust Jesus in salvation since the ascension, they were going to have to live and follow Jesus by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 and 7, Therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. And in his ascension, in his return to the Father, he would no longer be in her sight. It was going to alter the way in which she and all others would relate to him and to relate to the Father. Because as these words that Jesus says here tell us, we now can relate to the Father in much the same way that he relates to the Father. My Father and your Father. My God and your God. In salvation, we are adopted as children of the Father in heaven. He is our Father and our God. And because of Jesus and because of Him returning to the Father in heaven, we can experience true fellowship, true and intimate relationship because He's now our Father and our God. 1 John 3, 1, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. James 1, 17 and 18, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. In Psalm 103, 13, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. What Jesus is telling Mary here is that she must not cling to his body, to his physical presence in her life. Now she must cling to the one true God, the one whom Jesus had pointed to throughout his ministry. Through all of Jesus' earthly ministry, he taught this, that though his time on the earth was short, though he was going to and at this point, was going to return to the Father in heaven. Through him, she could cling to God because she can now relate to him as her spiritual father. Because that's what Jesus' resurrection and ascension made possible. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Talking about Jesus with the Father in heaven. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And this morning, as we think about and study through the resurrection as well, this is the relationship, this is the hope to which we 
all must cling as well. And this relationship is only possible through the resurrection of Jesus. This morning is a joyous morning, just like every morning is, because Jesus is alive. The tomb is empty. He has ascended, returned to the Father in heaven. And his resurrection proves to us beyond any shadow of a doubt that Jesus is who he claimed to be. That he has the power to do what he has promised to do. To show us that resurrection, that eternal life is indeed possible in him. This is the joy of the resurrection. The same power that worked in Jesus is even now at work in us. The same spirit is even now giving us spiritual strength and comfort in this life and serving as the guarantee of the life that we have to come in eternity. And with this in Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. The Spirit of God dwells inside each and every believer. This is what makes the resurrection possible. This is what the resurrection realizes in each and every follower of Christ. We celebrate not that just that Jesus died for our sins, but that he rose to new life, through which he's showing us that he is indeed the way, the truth, and the life that we can indeed come to the Father through him. Pray with me. Father God, this morning we are so thankful for this teaching, for this reminder of the resurrection of your son Jesus and his resurrection from the dead and everything that that tells us, everything that that gives us confidence in, the fact that he has the power and the authority and the privilege to offer life to all who believe in and follow him. This is our great hope. Through Jesus, you are our Father and our God. Thank you for promising life through your Son. Thank you for giving us the deposit of that in your spirit with us now and dwelling each and every one of us here with us together as your church here in Highland. Let's look forward to our own resurrection as well, knowing that in that we will begin our eternity of joy in your presence. All this we pray in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with us.
Amen, Lord. We thank you. We love you. We praise you for your word, Lord. We praise you for who you are, for being the mighty, just, holy, righteous God of the universe. We thank you for our time together this morning. We pray that, that your word would be active and alive in our hearts as we even continue on in this week. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed, church family. Thank you.